everybody and welcome to the latest episode of the Nordic Football Podcast. We're back. My name is Jonathan Faduba and I'm joined by my colleague as ever Steve Wiss. It's another week of Norway and Sweden to talk about. Uh, we're actually progressing through the season pretty quickly, aren't, aren't we Steve at the moment? Uh, things mm. are rolling along, you know, you wait for sort of three, you wait for six months for uh, Norwegian and Swedish football and then half the season's nearly gone, hasn't it? Uh, how are you today my friend and how are you? Yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, twelve games into the season now in Norway. Yeah, things are certainly progressing. Um, but I think we're over the really mad period of fixtures where you know it was Wednesday, Saturday. Uh, it looks like for the majority of the campaign now, it's going to be um, you know just Saturdays with the odd mid- midweek round. Uh, we'll go right through to December. But I mean, honestly, at times I felt absolutely snowed under with stuff. stuff to be honest, uh, but thankfully, I think uh, we're going to be. Uh, a bit more uh, more back to the old routine again. Certainly, uh, and we're 12 games in in uh, Norway and Sweden, 13 for some teams. By the time you listen to this, we'll be 13 games in pretty much, you know, coming up to the halfway point of the season, as we've mentioned. So, yeah, it's been really manic, to be honest, as you said. Uh, 97 matches played out of 188 total. 3.03 goals per match in Norway at the moment, which is where we're going to start this week. We're going to tuck into the Elite of Seven where there's been you know a lot of exciting stuff at the moment goals flying in everywhere isn't it yeah there has there's been a lot of goals uh, at the minute to uh, we'll come to the table at some point but uh, Budig do have a three point uh, lead at the top uh, at the time of recording with a game in hand against Mulder um, they beat them in the crucial head to head that we talked about in the last podcast um, and uh, Mulder also suffered a shock defeat against Sanderfjord of all teams we'll talk about that a bit more I'm sure but uh, yeah, goal, plenty of goals. In fact, the, the the last round of games, every single match had uh, contained at least over, over two point five goals. So uh, you wouldn't have wanted to be an underbacker, would you, in the Norwegian league uh, last weekend? Um, it just feels like the teams are well clued up now. They're up to proper fitness, and uh, you know there's a lot more sharpness about the attack forces uh, going forward. So plenty of entertainment on show. Let's just very quickly start with that big top of the table clash because we haven't talked about it on the on the show, the last show we previewed it. Um, in your opinion, you know, was it was it a fair result? And uh, you know, just for obviously it's a, it was a week ago now, so but um, you know, what was your takeaway from from that massive game between the two big boys of or two top of the table teams? I think the big takeaway for me was that uh, it was clear how uh, how much better these two teams are compared to the rest of the league like they're head and shoulders above the rest it was a good battle Mulder um, had periods of the game where they were strong like the first 15-20 minutes they, they looked good they took the lead in the game and uh, it actually took a set piece for Budigan to get back into the match I mean I felt at the start of the second half Mulder started well as well and uh, they had chances to go 2-1 ahead they couldn't take those chances and then around sort of 60-65 minutes Budigan took control they got a couple of goals to seal it, and then at the end of the game, it probably could have ended four or five, to be honest. Um, so I think it, ultimately the extra fitness of Buda Glimt uh, to last about the whole 90 minutes was crucial in that game. Uh, but Mulder certainly showed that they're worthy contenders as well. And um, But a huge result for Buda Glimt. I, I said that to win the title, they may have to beat them twice this year, and uh, that's the one out of the two done. But it was a good game of football, fitting top of the table clash, and uh, Buda Glimt came out on top. Yeah, and it finished Buda Glimp 3, Mulder 1. Mulder have actually played three games since then. Uh, they've played Warrenga 4-1, lost to Sandefjord, and then beat the start 5-0. You know, obviously those have, that, that's how they've recovered results-wise, but you know, you, you felt that their bigger squad maybe was a, a significant advantage for them maybe in, in terms of the title race. How have you felt they've recovered since then, and are you, are you encouraged by what you've seen? Obviously smashed well, they're going to start really, haven't they? Nine goals to one, but a bit of a surprise result, like you say, against Sandefjord. Though. The Sandefjord result totally threw me. I think it's probably the big, biggest shock of the season, as far as I'm concerned, um, because a second string Molder should go there and win easily, but they didn't. Um, I don't know what happened. I talk about their squad depth, but they've, they've been really tested defensively, you know, Jonathan. Uh, too many injuries have piled up there. They lost Martin Bjorn back recently for about a month. Um, in that game, that's a big blow. He's been the mainstay at the back for the last eighteen months. Ex Buda Glimp player, ironically. Um, 
So I think even their squad is just too depleted defensively, perhaps. Um, they might have to dip into the transfer market. Um, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things. They've got to get on with it. They've got decent squad overall, and I think in the long term they're going to be a serious threat still. Yeah, and for 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 Buda in that game, it was a, a lovely free kick from uh, Patrick Berg. Then Juncker and Jens Hauger came back with the goals uh, after Oe's opening strike. You've said there that Mulder, you know, may need to look at the squad a little bit. Buda Glimp, what what's the latest with them? Because they are the talk of the town at the moment. Aren't they? We had our wise cap block, and it was really really successful, wasn't it? Um, really, a lot of people are starting to take notice of them, not just in Norway and Scandinavia but even across Europe there uh, been a lot of rumours about their players leaving and that kind of thing hasn't it we had a player in focus on, on the last show um, we had some listener questions as well about some of some of their players the likes of Berg and Junker and Hauger what, what's the latest with them well Jens Petter Hauger was obviously strongly linked with the move to one of the Bruges teams in Belgium he has now called that move off um, he will not be going there anymore and he said he's going to stay at Buda Glimt until the end of the season which I, I think that's sensible because um, I think, and I think Budiglin are going to probably have that attitude to try and keep all their players until the end of the season, try and get this title won, have a run in Europe or whatever, and then probably cash in on some players. And, and I'm guessing quite a few more want to move on to pastures new anyway. Then, so I think that's going to be their strategy going forward. Obviously, you know things can change if a really big offers come in in the summer, so they'll maybe tested in that way. But I think the strategy is is to try and keep this squad together for this season, and then. Uh, at the end of the campaign, maybe a few big changes, but I think Jens Petter Hauger is going to get a lot of a, a much better club than uh, Circle Bruges now because um, he, he's, he's at a better level than them. Yeah, and speaking of uh, changes, there's been quite a big change, isn't there? One of the one of the biggest clubs in the league, and that is Bram. Now they've had a managerial change, haven't they? They're not doing amazingly well in terms of the table. Um, well, eighth. Uh, Tell us about what the latest is with Brand, because they're, they're, they're a big club, aren't they? And, uh, we talk about them often, but uh, they haven't really been up at the top of the table in recent seasons, have they? Not consistently enough, Jonathan, no. Um, Lajan Nielsen has been sacked by Brand. He came to the club in uh, May 2015, and he, uh, it's, so it's been a long stint. Uh, you don't often get a manager stay anywhere for five years these days, do you, to be fair? So... Um, I mean, he's had an, an intriguing record. He, he led them to promotion. He's led them to uh, a second place and a third place finish in the elite Assyrian. Uh, but I, I feel it was probably a fair sacking. And I said this at the back end of uh, last season in one of the episodes that I felt they should have moved on from him. You know, in November two thousand, December two thousand and nineteen, really it would have been much more sensible. It was clear, just a change of direction was needed at the club. Um, there's a few issues that have come to light with with Lajan and Nielsen. I think ultimately he just got a little bit stale at Brand, too negative. But it's a very tough job, you know. And I think um, it's, it'd be, I don't want to criticise Lajan and Nielsen because I think he's done very well here actually over the five years. Uh, they probably should have won the title in 2018. Um, he's been very competitive at times, but yeah, sometimes you've got to make the change. And I think Brand would have been much more sensible doing it end of last season but fair play to them they, they just realised something new's got someone someone new has got to take over now tell us about the new man in charge we don't know the new man yet but it, it looks like they're uh, in talks with ex Rosenborg manager Cora Inga Brixen who I mean this is interesting about who they bring in because this is a big a big decision for Bran um, they're not historically a club that likes to sack their managers they usually give the managers plenty of time and so they've got to get this right. They can't afford to have someone like uh, an Irish Corneland uh, take over or Ronnie Dyler like Volarenga did and waste two years or something. Um, there's three sort of options they can go down. They can go down the route of appoint someone from within the Norwegian system, say Elita Serien or Obosel again, who's going well, maybe a young up upcoming coach, perhaps Marti Sifuentes at Sanderfield would be an example of that. Uh, they can go down the experience route like Cora Inga Brixen or someone uh, of a bigger name reputation an older head perhaps or, or then maybe they could look outside of Scandinavia maybe someone completely foreign uh, and random and, and not I'm not saying unheard of but sort of 
not out of the textbook that you would normally go with. Uh, it's a big decision for, for Buran. I would love to see them uh, take a chance on someone up and coming, you know, in the Obos League again or Elite Serian, like I say. I don't think they're going to do that route. I think they're looking to try and get someone like Inga Brixen. It's a really tough job. It's one of the, one of the toughest jobs I, I can think of because there's high expectations. The squad has got quite a few big characters in it. A sort of a couple of guys who think they're Bertie Big Bollocks, you know what I mean? I think they're better than they are. And um, it's difficult. They've got to combine man management along with uh, high expectations. It's, it's a tricky situation. Yeah, and a few words from their uh, sports manager, Runa Saltfer. He said, the requirements are already here. Being a coach in brand means high demand. It is the most unique club in Norway to coach. For better or for worse, there's high demand. You will win matches and you will entertain. Being a coach in brand is a completely different sport. These are very high demands and there are people who cannot meet them. And then there are also those who really want to meet them. I think many are triggered by that because it is a f fantastic club to be in. You somehow have not been in Norwegian football if you've not been in brand. Now, you know, I think he's got a future as uh, working in PR <laughs> if he doesn't uh, join the brand tourism board if he doesn't you know, work out for him in the football side of it because that is some serious uh, gladiator style motivational brave heart words I have to say um, even I want to manage brand now the way he's talked about but uh, <laughs> no it's, it's you, you said there's some coaches that would be would be maybe interesting for the role um, and yeah I think you know you, I think you even tweeted some of the favourites for the job didn't you in terms of the bookmakers favourites so I guess it's watch this space one thing I've noted about brand and maybe this just reflects how well, going back to the top of the table, Buda Glimt has been doing. Buda Glimt has scored 27 more goals than Brand in 12 games. I mean, that is an incredible ratio. Um, 16 goals for Brand in 12 games, which, you know, even bottom of the table, Arlison has scored that many. Um, is it a case of just the balance isn't right? Because they've only conceded 19, so you know, that mid-table position is, you know, bang on mid-table, really, isn't it? 1-4, drawn 3, lost 5. Is it just that the balance isn't quite right, or is it just much of a much in terms of the not scoring enough goals and not really keeping them out either well in my pre-season uh, predictions in the podcast I actually said they've got a, a squad that's good enough to challenge for a medal or even the title as a proper dark horse if they had the right sort of manager in charge but I knew they would never achieve that under Lars Arne Nielsen um, they've got attacking talent but I don't think Nielsen's all got the best out of them we know last season he had disagreements with Doda Bamber Gilbert Coombson now he's got a, he's got more out of them players this year, but you just sense that the players, uh, after a certain say two or three years working under someone like Tony Pulis, you're going to get ground down, aren't you, as an attacker, or, or you know a, someone a winger or whatever. I'm not saying Lazar Nielsen's like Tony Pulis, but he's a more negative-minded manager, and I think that these, some of these attacking players would be looking at sides like Mulder, Buda Glimt, and recently Rosenborg when they were playing well. You know, thinking, why can't we play like that? Why can't we play in a system that's fast-paced, pass the ball on the deck, you know what I mean, pressing, stuff like that, rather than sort of long ball sometimes, a bit of old-fashioned football. I think that's what Brand need. They need a, a coach as a more modern way of thinking in that way. And they certainly need to be scoring more goals because the ability in the squad is there. You know, the, all around the whole pitch, actually, the ability is there to get them in the top four. It's about finding the right manager now to take them forward in the new direction. Yeah, and just a few, you know, final words in terms of uh, Lars Arne Nielsen. I suppose do you expect him to be back soon? I mean, brand, former Brand player Eric Huzaklip came out and said, "I hope he is remem remembered for what he did for the club. He's been a successful Brand coach and has done a good job." So, you know, just a few final words on Lars Arne Nielsen. Mm, yeah, definitely, really, like, um, a positive words from him. Um, I agree with what Huzaklip um, said there. I think he's, he looked back on his time, and it has to be classed as, as a success. He took them back up from the Obosl again um, and don't underestimate that job look well our Lillestrom at the minute are like mid, mid to lower table in the Obos it's bloody hard taking a, a giant of a club back sometimes because expectations are so high immediately on promotion he got him second place we we were doing the podcast in 2018 when they perhaps should have won the title uh, I never felt things were never the same after they got Erling Brown Harlanded you know, twice when he battered him. I just felt things were never the same there. But, hey, I think Nielsen is still a very good coach. He's got a lot, lot to offer. He could get a job any, in the, any of the top flight leagues in Scandinavia, in my opinion, and hold his own quite comfortably. 
Um, but um, maybe his methods are a little bit old fashioned at times, but that's not a bad thing. Um, and there's certainly lots of clubs out there that would snap your hand off to get him. So good luck to him. Well, it sounds like we haven't seen the last of him, and you know, Brown aren't going to be the first, and uh, well, they may have been the first, but they're not going to be the last, you would imagine, to be Eric Erling Braut Harland, to be honest, given his incredible <laughs> goal scoring ratio. So um, let's move on. Uh, and we're going to talk. We're going to sort of skip to the bottom of the league now, and you want to talk about uh, Sandefjord because they've had some pretty interesting uh, results of late. Obviously, beating Molde two one, and also beat Mjondalen and, and played Rosenborg recently in July. You got some words on them, haven't you? Mm, I do. I, I'm, I'm actually highly impressed with Sandefjord and what they're doing at the moment this season. Because on paper, right, this is the worst squad in the league, in my opinion. Still, even now. And I think you've got to give huge credit to the manager, Marty uh, Sifuentes, who has uh, come uh, and won, th won three of the last five games, uh, Jonathan, including a shock victory against Mulder. They were 1 0 up against Christiansen for 70 minutes as well. And really, only what did them in that game was squad depth. Uh, Christiansen brought on like four or five subs at the same time and completely changed the game, as, as can happen with the five sub rule. And, you know, they pushed Rosenborg close as well in, in a game they lost in that period. And um, he's getting the absolute most out of his team, I, I tell you. Um, but the thing is, they're not, they've not just been lucky with their results either. If you look at the expected goals in the games and, and the actual shots fired, they're really restricting their op the opposition quite well. So I can tell you that's why, the, why they've been getting the results statistically. It's not through sheer luck. They're actually deserving the outcome. Uh, I mean, I actually can't put my finger on how they manage it on the field itself tactically. I'm really going to have to go in detail on Sandefjord because something's not right. Logically, they should not be performing as they are. So something uh, very strange is afoot, but um, you've got to give them a lot, a lot of credit right now. They're, they're, they're doing really well. Yeah, and obviously against uh, Mould, uh, they went 1-0 down. Uh, Brynjolfsson scored. And then Rufo came back. A bit of a defensive mistake, wasn't it? A bit of a howler from mm. the, uh, the defender there, in fact, letting him in. And then Mark Vallet in the 90th minute penalty um, to seal the win. You said you're going to have to maybe do a bit of a deep dive on, 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 on Sanders. And, and just, just look at it in terms of how they, you know, possession wise, they're actually doing reasonably well, you know, averaging sort of 50, roughly 50 50 possession. Um, expected goals is kind of. Not too bad. What is your theory in terms of where, where you know, without doing a massive dive into it, like you said, what is your theory? Is it just really good management? You know, um, Sifuentes, as you've mentioned already, as a potential black brand uh, replacement that that brand. Um, a, would he be a sort of candidate that you think would actually take the job? Uh, and B, is it just because of his, you know, really good management? And what is his manage What is his management style? Because he's got that kind of he's, he's obviously Spanish, isn't he? Um, Yes, um, I, I, the thing is, usually I can tell by watching the games, um, certainly after a few games, any I can tell with my own eyes without even looking at stats what what the what the strengths and weaknesses are of sides and how they're managing to do, achieve something. But with Sandefjord, I'm a bit stumped. I must say, um, I was watching, for example, uh, Sandefjord uh, when they lost at Rosenborg. Now, Rosenborg dominated that game. I felt they dominated the game for a good hour or so. But looking back at it, they actually hardly had a shot in the game, in the match. It's like they restricted them really well. It was the same against Mulder as well. Like Mulder just create chances at will against anyone, right? And although they were going down to ten men for half a game, it's still no excuse. Mulder hardly really created, apart from a couple of clear cut chances. That was it. I mean, something's obviously going right there in terms of. I think it's tactical setup with the manager. To be honest with you, Jonathan, he, he's getting it right in terms of. Um, playing to the strengths of the side it's not luck because they're not fluking their way to the results the only other explanation could be that actually are the players better than I think they are or the general consensus of them is we might be underestimating the quality of the players like the goalkeeper for example I had him down as probably the worst in the league but he's at, I've seen him make a few decent saves a couple of world class saves actually so could be it could be a combination of all three things but Sefuentes is a good tactically astute manager. Even when he took over when they were doomed a couple of years ago in the Elite Serie, he made them competitive. He tends to stay 
closing the games and um, I think they, they've learned the lesson from uh, one or two bigger beatings earlier this season and um, it just sets I just think he sets up the side really well like 4-2-3-1 mostly and that um, there's a good couple of the players that shield the defence usually put in a very good stint and they're definitely I say restricting the opposition from getting shots on target or even shots in general uh, they're quite happy to let sides get crosses in because they seem to be able to deal with them quite well so I think full marks to Sifuentes um, he's just a good all round coach he's, he can mix it obviously getting promoted last season they were scoring plenty of goals as well so he's not just a defensive manager or anything like that good all round coach yeah and Sifuentes is quite a young coach only 38 he's managed um, in Spain in lower leagues he's also been a coach in Ajax and Millwall at short spells coaching there and also at AIK so Definitely, he's got a decent body of experience in terms of experience in different styles and understanding different tactical setups. Maybe uh, looks like he's he's one to watch potentially. And Sandefjord at present are twelve, so hovering just above the relegation zone, four points, which isn't isn't bad. Um, and just one place below them is Viking. Now, our good friend Ted Cruz, eight, my son, uh, has a question. I think CJ about that. Uh, what is going on at Viking? Uh, let me grab his question for you, if I can. He asks, why are Viking struggling so much? Well, um, I think it's a combination of things, really. Remember this time last year, or certainly the start of the 2019 campaign, I think I was predicting that Viking would just about stay up, but maybe just by the skin of their teeth. And they had an amazing year. They finished fifth. They won the cup. They totally overachieved, really. And, you know, what's happened is they've kind of reverted back to more the other way this year. They, they lost two or three key players. They've had injuries. They've lost a lot of games late on. Um, and I feel they should have some more points on the board. But I just think it's simply a case of they had one brilliant year and, and they're kind of going back to earth in, in 2020. It's as simple as that, really. I don't think there's anything to panic about. There's a long way to go this year. They're going to have enough quality to survive fairly comfortably, I think, in my opinion. The manager absolutely should... Uh, they, should they should stay faithful with him, no problem. He proved last year, two, the last two years, how, how good he's been for the club. Uh, just a blip for me. Um, I, I expect him to come good, no problem. Um, but I just think last year expectations were raised too much I remember when I did my initial preview at home um, and I was looking at them and I was thinking you know what they're going to regress to sort of mid-table and I probably should have gone with that initial gut feeling because then I was looking at a few other pundits and, and, and whatnot and, and it kind of made me feel like I was seeing a bit more sense by putting them in the top six but really I should have gone with my gut instinct with Viking this year and, and, and it was realistic to expect them just to drop down so yeah things haven't gone their way but I think they can turn it Fantastic stuff. Uh, and let's move on. I mean, we haven't talked about Rosenbaum in the show, which I don't think we're even going to. Or are we? Um, you, you, you've highlighted Mjöndal in the team that you'd like to look at, mm. and uh, some issues there at the moment. Yeah, I'm going to talk about Mjöndal because they are on a really bad uh, losing streak at the moment. Uh, I think it's like eight eight matches in a row that they've suffered the defeat, and it's put them 15th in the table. And I've seen a few people saying, you know, they should be doing better than they have been but I completely disagree they've uh, again look at where pre-season what, what did we expect of Mjöndal and we I expected them to be in that bottom three you know as, as far as I'm concerned the three weakest squads in the league are Mjöndal and Start and uh, Sandefjord and uh, although we expected more of Orlesund logically now looking at that squad perhaps you can see where it's, why you know maybe it would be in the worst five squads as well but we got overhyped by a couple of players. And Mian Dahlen have lost eight in a row, but they've actually been very unlucky. There was an article uh, on the Nordic Bet blog that I read uh, about referee decisions this year, which it's been a shocking year for referees, by the way, in the Elite Serien. And they have been done over, as in bad luck stories, uh, by the referee have affected Mian Dahlen by, with any other team more than them. And... I think the problem is that they're very physical. They're clearly the most physical side in the league. Certainly now that Lillestrom got relegated. And it's almost as if the referees have come together, maybe in some meeting, saying, we're not going to put up with their physicality anymore. And they're just penalising them for everything. 
I don't, I don't like that because Norway was one of the few leagues left that I've watched that they let physical play go a lot more. But it feels like they're stamping down on it a bit more this season. And Mjöndalen have borne the brunt of it. They've had disallowed goals for pushes. Seems like they've been given red cards when perhaps it was a bit harsh. Stuff like that. And it, a lot of things have been going their way. They've been they've lost something like these games in a row. But I feel like on, a, on another day it could have gone a different way. Um, they're not as bad as their results suggest. Now... You're a bit of a fan of VAR, aren't you, Steve? Are you, are you suggesting that maybe it's time for VAR to enter the Norwegian world? I think it's getting to a point where it's hard to defend not having it. Um, I, I'm not actually the biggest fan of VAR in a lot of ways. Um, as I say, I think it ruins a lot of things in the, in the game about you know you're celebrating a goal and stuff like that. You can't really celebrate until the game's kicked off again, can you? And I felt the VAR was work, would actually was actually working all right in Norway without it, but when referees are getting so many big decisions wrong, and I mean big decisions, uh, they're going to have to look at bringing it in. I think in the next couple of years, it's just going to have to happen. It's, uh, clearly, they haven't got the quality of referees that can spot clear and obvious things. And um, look, VAR, I'm sure, will be more rounded in in two or three years anyway across the world. And when that's the case, then I'm sure Norway can bring it in. But yeah, it's looking like we're going to have to go down that route, that route going forward. I think, which is a shame because I think it was it, it seemed to be going all right without it. But um, it's very, been a very very poor year for the officials. I'm afraid, Jonathan. It seems like you know it's not only uh, maybe English football then where standard refereeing seems to be slipping, isn't it? Maybe mm. maybe video technology is giving people a bit of uh, excuses and a bit of slack to uh, you know. Yeah, cut, cut, cut for, uh, you know standards. I, I feel the same happening in cricket a little bit with umpires. It's like they they, they play to the system now a lot more. Um, and they're not even umpires are not even giving no balls in Test cricket now. It's the computers doing it. We're going to get to a stage in future where the computer gives out all the bloody decisions or something like that. It's um, I do yeah. The, the standard of refereeing has gone down. Uh, I think. Uh, but there's been a highlight. This uh, this blog actually was a really good uh, read about on Nordic but about the, the amount of decisions that have gone against sides that were clear and obvious and shouldn't have. And there's some real shockers that have just affected teams badly. But I say Mjern Dahlen especially have been hit hard and it seems like the two sides that have um, not been hit as bad. Christiansen just one really shocking decision against them and Horgerson just two. So they've been all right. But sides like... Um, Mjöndal and Odd Viking have had some uh, bad stuff go against them. Fantastic stuff. And yeah, for anyone who wants to know more about Mjöndal, we interviewed their manager, Nigar Hansen. Uh, series 3, episode 19. So you could dig back into the archives about November last year and have a listen to that because that's what we do on the Knowledge Football Podcast. We bring you uh, exclusive insight and access where possible. So yes, have a little listen to that if you'd like to hear about the tactical philosophies. But they are... Uh, Struggling a little bit, obviously lost 3 0 at start, lost 2 0 at home to Odd, and lost 1 0 at Sandifu in their last three games. So, a bit of a struggle there for me, and they are in the relegation zone together with Arlen. They'll be they fine, I'll tell you, they'll, they'll be alright, I think. Vegar Hansen's a very good manager. Um, they're absolutely, they wouldn't sack him anyway, but they'd be foolish to even consider it. Probably. He's uh, a top manager, and I think he can certainly at least get them to the relegation playoff match. Well, before we wrap up this half of the show, uh, well, starters also only got one win um, all season out of 13 games. They're, they're sort of third bottom. Um, but Steve, we've got another good, quite a good listener question from Andy Watson at Andy Watson Sport who asks, would any of the Buddha Glimp players be successful in the English game? Uh, I really like Patrick Bird personally, but I'm not sure where he would fit in the EFL slash EPL. So... Um, yeah, we, we we touched on the title race a little bit there. Maybe you can elaborate as well if you've got any more thoughts on the title race. Buda Glimp, the only unbeaten side now in the division. Haven't lost a single game yet. 12 games, 11 wins, 1 draw. Um, any other players you think could make it in England? Hey, yeah, good question. <laughs> you know, I was just suddenly thinking there. I almost rem reminded my own self of uh, something like Danny Murphy on Match of the Day when he's asked the question, oh, how are they going to get on this season? They'll be fine, no problem. <laughs> when I was talking about the end on anyway on to Buda Glimp um, I mean god it's so hard to say isn't it down the line but I think you could look at that squad 
And so, uh, yeah, you know, Jens Petter Hager, Zinkenagel, Patrick Berg. I think if they maybe beefed up a little bit physically, they could uh, certainly do well in English football down the line. It's really hard to say. Uh, it just is. It's just a difficult comparison. Um, at what level of English football as well? If we're talking Premier League level, I don't think any of them are ready for that yet. Uh, perhaps, but uh, in time, I'm sure it can it could happen. Duff, tricky question, really, but yeah, Patrick Berg, he's right there. Is um, I've seen a lot of people say that they think he's been their best player this season, or certainly their most important player in his position, and, and they're not far wrong. A lot of the limelight goes on the the strikers, you know, Juncker and Zinkenagel, Inspector Holger, but yeah, Patrick Berg is doing a fantastic job there in that uh, deeper role in midfield. Um, he's having a storming season. Okay, I think that pretty much wraps it up for this yeah. uh, half of the show. We, think we are going to add some, have some more listener questions uh, later on. But so, uh, you know, let's take a little break now and come back in a minute with Sweden. Is there any final thoughts? Any any games we should look out for in the next week or so, Steve? Before we wrap up, uh, I think it's going to be interesting. Mulder against Brand. You know, how are Brand going to cope uh, with a, uh, without Lars Lars and Nielsen for the first time in five years? So uh, that's a good one to watch out for. Um, coming up uh, this weekend but yeah no no other thoughts I think um, it's a really interesting league to watch at the minute I would encourage anyone to try and catch a stream of it uh, or on TV whenever they can so uh, it's been good viewing fantastic stuff let's wrap it up then for this uh, Norwegian section and when we come back after this little break we're going to talk about Sweden and some managerial changes and quite a few there's been a bit of a shake up in Swedish football at the moment so Join us after this break for part two. Welcome back to the Nordic Football Podcast and in this section we're going to be talking about uh, Swedish uh, matters but uh, before then I just wanted to talk about the uh, Patreon section that we've uh, got set up and uh, we've had some uh, recent patrons that have uh, been very generously uh, joined us, uh, haven't they Jonathan? Yeah, just firstly before we get into the Swedish section I wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who has hit us up on Patreon, we, we uh, tag, we dropped the link last week in the um, patreon.com slash nordic football podcast and we've had a few people sign up and of course as part of that we're going to give you a little pledge uh, I've given a little pledge we're going to have a little thank you to those people so uh, firstly of course uh, alumni Jürgen Hernholm if you're listening big shout out to you for, for your contributions in, in, in past seasons really appreciate your support in the past but we've got some new patrons this season uh, the first one I want to give a, a big praise to is Charlotte Patterson. Thank you so much for um, joining the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer tier. Really appreciate you giving your support for us. Uh, it's going to help us keep going for a while. So you're not going to be able to get rid of Meat Man Soccer anytime soon. You're not going to be able to get rid of me anytime soon. We're going to be giving you even more content. Uh, next on the list, um, Alexander Christensen. Thanks a lot for your support as well. Um, team Overs as well. Join the Oligan Assault Shots here, really appreciate it. And then Tom Sutton as well um, on the Elick, Erling Brout Harland tier. Uh, you guys are very much appreciated. You're going to help to support us uh, on the show. I I'm actually doing a, a donation, so my first uh, for the first month at least minimum, I will match all patrons and um, we'll be giving uh, my donation to charity. So um, if you do want to support the podcast, you know, I won't be drinking my beers this month, but uh, if you do want to sort of buy us a beer or a coffee or a thicker, for our, um, you know, for the work that we do, we're putting this show together, um, you know, most weeks for you. Then go to Patreon.com/slash Nordic Football Podcast or follow us on Twitter at Nordic Football, and we'll obviously post the links there during the week. But yeah, just wanted to firstly say before we get into this section, you know, you guys are really appreciated, and you know, we, we appreciate that in, in these sort of times, um, for you to dip into pocket and help us out is it, 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 really, um, like I say, um, we. We feel the love, and it just shows that the, the show continues to grow. and And I hope we're providing value for you. So we're going to keep doing what we're doing, and there will be some bonus content coming soon. So keep an eye out for that. We're just putting it together at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's good good news, isn't it, Steve? 
It's very good news, and uh, yeah, I know you're uh, giving, uh, you're, you're donating your share of it to Red Cross uh, Lebanon for the uh, Beirut uh, from there. Um, someone has to pay for my stake, so uh, I think I'll have to keep my share. No, no, I'm actually, I'll match you with that actually. I'll match you with it for the first month. I mean, it's a very good cause, and um, you know, obviously that was a terrible thing that went on there. But so, yeah, we we certainly appreciate um, all the new patrons, um, and uh, if you feel feeling really generous then obviously we'd appreciate even more but uh, thanks for your support and all the kind words as well um, we wouldn't be doing it without such a great community behind us yeah I think that's the key as well that, you know the community thing we're really feeling the love this season I think I think we've really to be honest grown a lot I think it's fair to say well, that, you know the community thing we're really feeling the love this season I think I think we've really to be honest grown a lot I think it's fair to say um, getting a lot more listener questions this season, you know, people are really engaging with both leagues, and I think it's it shows that there's potential in these leagues, isn't it? It's growing, the attention is growing. Uh, if you're listening, Tim Capel and Eurosport, please continue to show uh, Elite Serian. And by the way, you've got the right to Osvenskan, so I want you to put Osvenskan on British TV as soon as possible, so that I can avoid watching it on tiny screens. Um, I need that in my life on HD. So yeah, please hit us up if you would need help with that as well. Um, you know, maybe we can do some sort of partnership. Uh, but yeah, you've got the rights. Get it on the TV. That's what I say. <laughs> um, but let's move on, Hey Steve, because we're yeah. going to touch on Sweden now. It's been quite a busy time, hasn't it? As you said. Yeah, in I mean, way. it's mad at the moment. The, the last time um, on the podcast, basically, you were saying that Norrköping were looking like a shoe in for the title. But my how the tables have turned. They've uh, their form has badly dropped. And Malmo have took over at the uh, the summit of the table uh, on a great run of form there in the league anyway. What on earth uh, has gone wrong for uh, Norshipping since we last talked? Yeah, shoe in and shoe out, I think. Uh, my shoe's now firmly out of this one because six wins in a row from Malmo, which, has, you know, since they drew with Norshipping, Norshipping managed to sneak an 88th minute goal in that game. And really, since then, it, it's been the tables have turned. Uh, Malmo went to Ostersunds 1-2-1, beat Kalmar, smashed Hammerby 3-0, beat Sirius 5-2 away, beat EF Core Jotobrug 3-0 away. That was after the cup final, by the way, which uh, they lost. Uh, EF Core won the Swedish Cup um, against Malmo. And then in the league recently, the most recent game, they beat Helsingborg, their local rivals, uh, in the derby 4-1. So they are flying at the moment. And I'll be honest with you, they are really starting to look good. Um, I like what I see from Malmo. You know, I was a little bit hesitant, I suppose, about uh, Jonathan Thomason early. I said, you know, is, is he has he got enough experience at this level to to ma match the expectations? Obviously, there's no fans, so he's maybe fortunate from that perspective. You know, he doesn't have the fans getting on his back after the early um, you know blip in the season they, where they had three draws in a row and only won one of their sort of uh, one of six games. Um, but he's turned around and now they're top of the league and a lot of it is also to do with North Shopping who just seem to have collapsed um, such a good start to the season but uh, it's, it's been a bit of a wobble and the fans are kind of not happy at the moment actually there's been um, a bit of discontent around North Shopping yeah I guess it's not too much of a, a big shock that Malmo have actually strung together a run of results they've been threatening that for a good uh, year or two haven't they really uh, but North Shipping is it's a worrying worrying slide and it um, seems to me like the defence has let them down badly. They conceded quite a lot of goals in this period. Is that the main issue? Yeah, it is. And I think they've just, they've just become quite sloppy, I think. And um, there's been quite a bit of criticism for their manager just in terms of the way they're managing games. I don't think they're really sort of tending to manage games that well. Where early in the season, it just looks so, it looks so dominant in games and and they look like they could take anyone on. I think, you know, whether it's nerves or whether it's just sort of poor form or things sort of caught up with them, you know, from my point of view, they got, I think, pretty much the best, arguably the best squad in, in, in Sweden in terms of, you know, they keep adding players as well. Um, you know, Linus Valkis now as well, Linus Hellenius, they, they've got players coming in as well, so they're not even stopping uh, their kind of march of bringing players in. But... Just recently, they, they've been they've been sloppy games that they should really have won. They're not doing so. Um, lost to Sirius, which I think was a, you know that was their first defeat of the season. They they recovered beating Varberg, but drawing away at Falkenberg, you know who are you know by all accounts one of the worst teams in the league. 
um, if not the worst. That was pretty a really poor result, and they needed a last minute goal from Haxabanovic even to get a point from Falkenberg. And then Mialbi they drew one one all, and then obviously Bickle happened. That was the big game uh, of the week, and they'd lost that two one, and it was comprehensive to be honest. They weren't in it. Yeah, I mean, what are the actual expectations then from North Shipping fans? I mean, you say the manager's under pressure. Did they really expect to be challenging for the league? I mean, I'm sure if you offered their fans second place after 13 games, they'd have snapped your hand off, wouldn't they? I think you'd have to ask ask the fans that, to be, to be honest. Um, and it might be an interesting one. Maybe we could put that on Twitter and ask fans what the actual, you know, raw expectation is. I think... It's like anything, Steve. When you when you start winning games like that, I mean, they were so far clear. I think it was at least seven, eight points. Um, you know, last time we spoke, to be honest, and that wasn't even that was just over a week ago. So, you know, the time is flying in the North Spence game at the moment. We're nearly. I mean, we've only it was only two months ago we did the pre-season podcast, and we're now nearly halfway through the campaign. It's it's, it's flown by. Really intense schedule, um, as you've said, and maybe you know maybe a bit of fatigue has crept in with with, with North Shopping. Maybe teams are starting to figure them out a little bit. Um, there's no doubt that Hacken were a better side. Um, obviously, they had a red card as well, North Shipping in that game. But um, Hacken looked really, really good at this moment in time. I think fans, well, it's difficult to know. You know, I think I think I think the, the frustration really is coming from the fact that they're just not not locking off games that maybe they should lock off. And mm-hmm. when you're so far ahead of, in the table, as I've just said, you know, you, you, there's an expectation, isn't there? Really, they shouldn't have lost it so quickly. It just, I think maybe it's the speed at which they've gone from sort of like well clear to to sort of now second place and, and cat playing catch up I think that's just the, the re- re- rapidity of it they haven't even had a chance to really enjoy it I suppose when you have a normal season at least you've got a few weeks isn't it yeah. it will take you about three four weeks before you, you if, even if you're losing games at least you've got a good month or so to enjoy being top North Shipping have had about two weeks to enjoy it and now it's gone so maybe there's that kind of element to it but um yeah, it's not exactly happy times uh, at North Shipping at, at this moment, moment in time, really. Yeah, a couple of years ago when Brand were uh, probably should have won the league, at least they had their moment in the sun where they were top of the league for quite a long, a long time, really. Um, but yeah, maybe just for sheer frustration from North Shipping. Uh, I guess the question now is, can they rebound? Do you think um, are Malmo going to be the shoe in tip from Jonathan for Dugba to win the league from this point onwards? And uh, <laughs> could I mean could someone like I don't know Hecken, Jurgen, Elfsborg come into the race? Well, you know I've given up predicting things. You know, it's just uh, <laughs> I just get it wrong. Though. So, uh, I think that I'm, I'm going to stick stop predicting stuff. I think is probably the best answer so far <laughs> this season. But I think I think one thing on North Shopping, you know, let's be clear as well that they, they spent money, you know, and um, they gave a massive contract to Haxabanovic. You know, they bought him back for a rumored really big fee. I think, I think it was at least two to three million euros, roughly, uh, from West Ham. You know, he's a big player, and as I've said before, he's one of the top players in the league. I think he's goals, and I think he's top of the league for goals and assists in total, you know, combined. Um, they've recently bought back Linus Valkvist, who, if you remember, I talked about him a lot two, three years ago. He was quality um, back in the day, right back. You know. Uh, Teams like Paderborn, Twente, they wanted him, but he's gone now back to Sweden. He's rejoined um, no shopping. You know, so they're paying money for these players, and, and they've got a really sort of solid squad. You know, he said he wanted to come home. It was attractive to him. He wouldn't have come home if if, if the team wasn't doing so well as they have been. You know, he's rejoined from um, you know uh, Dynamo Dresden. So they've got good players. You know, Linus Hellenius. He was at Apoel. He was what, second top scorer in the league. He's come back now. There's, there's the, the structure is there now, and they've got the level of experience. It's not like they're a young team who's sort of, you know, moulding together or anything like that. They, they've got some experienced players, and this is the year, really, given the slow start of Malmo, given the really poor start of AIK, given the really poor start of Hammerby, um, given your garden sort of, although they're recovering now, in fairness to them, given their slow start, this was the chance for Norshipping to really establish themselves. And they, I think they've just, it's like a relay race where you go miles in front and then you, you trip over. And um, you know it's not a good thing, is it? So that's the worry for them, and they now sort of have to sort of dust themselves down, and, and I suppose go again, really. And it's it's kind of starting from scratch, which mm. probably might frustrate the fans. Yeah, I mean, obviously they just lost to Hecken uh, two one there, and I know you're quite impressed with Hecken in that game, and uh, they also had a good result not too long before beat AI Core four nil. So are they just starting to hit form. 
Yeah, I like what I see from Hecker. I think um, their manager deserves a lot of praise. We haven't really talked about them much this season, but uh, third in the table for goals scored, obviously, um, doing very well in terms of their entertainment value. I, I think they're an exciting team to watch. I, I like the way they play uh, the game. They're quite fast-paced. They, they're aggressive in what they try and do. I think you were bang on about Sutherland, by the way. Um, Alexander Sutherland looks a player. And I think he's brought maybe that bit of maturity that you said he would bring. Um, maybe that just level of expectation. He, he, he scored both goals, obviously, in this game. 2-1 winning against no shopping. Um, you know, they're fifth in the table for shots, have 165 shots. Actually, you're going to the top of the league for shots. Um, so you're going to start to recover, by the way. Don't rule them out by any means um, under their really good management team. But, uh, no, I, I think that... Um, there's a lot to like about Hack and what they're doing at the moment. I think they've gone under the radar a little bit, or even we haven't talked about them too much, but uh, I, I like what I see. Yeah, it's Sutherland. I always thought he'd do well there if he stays fit. He, he'll score them goals. And it looks like Heck and um, are on their way to another top five finish in the league. But, um, I mean, I did mention that they had a good 4 0 against uh, IE Core, and. Uh, I, I couldn't. I, I was looking for them in the table, and uh, I just have to keep keep zooming down, uh, scrolling down. Sorry, uh, they're down in twelfth. I call twelfth position, um, just one point clear of the relegation playoff spot, which is ridiculous. They've got a new manager um, though now, Jonathan. It looks like they bloody need one. Uh, it's been an absolute disaster. Yeah, Bartosz Grzelak, uh, Rickard Norling has been sacked, which is big news really because he is a, you know, not only a really good manager and who won the title, not don't forget, not so long ago with a team that had an incredible defensive record, um, but he's also a really charismatic sort of personality, very well respected in Sweden. When he announced he was leaving, he, he gave a press conference and there was almost a sense like, you know, don't leave me type thing, you know, the fans were quite gutted. Um, there was also I, I saw a, a Twitter account called AIK Report. They already within him within about a day of him leaving, they were like, "Will he ever return?" And had a poll saying, "Will he return?" And you know, um, so from that point of view, you kind of felt a bit bad in the sense that they sacked him and seemed to almost regret it immediately. But um, there's no doubt this is a transition season for AIK. I, I actually think it's quite sad that they've got rid of Norlin. Um, yes, they've been really poor, but you know, teams have transition se seasons sometimes, and I think. I look at it a bit like a Pochettino when he got sacked at Spurs. You know, it's kind of better the devil you know. You know, is it? Is it? Is it? Do you just take the transition? You know, Spurs needed that transition. They need. They needed something new. The, the team had gone a bit stale. And I look at ARK quite similarly. To be honest, there's been talks in the past week of Daniel Sundgren returning to the club. You know, they're trying to get like, old players back. I just think the recruitment side of it is the area that they really need to sort of focus on. They're trying to bring young talents through, and they've got some really good young talents. You know, Paulos Abraham um, and those sort of players. I've told you, I've talked about Robin Tihi, you know, I've a Y Scout blog about him. Um, you know, they've got, this is just a season where they're going to have to write it off, kind of. And, 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 you know, for the fans at least, they don't have to go to the games. You know, they can save some money in their pockets and just watch it from home. So, from that point of view, I, I would argue that maybe they could have just kept Norling and let him guide the um, this redevelopment they're going to need. The older players are just kind of. I don't want to be harsh on them and say they're, they're going stale, but they're just starting to maybe age a bit. They're still leading responsibly, you know, Henrik Goitem, Seb Larsson, but they just, you know, are they really at it now? Is it too much for them maybe? Are they are they really sort of providing what's needed? I, I don't know. Um, statistically, statistically, those things, they are really, you know, you can ask me some questions about this because they are really struggling. Do you know what? I've said it before. I think if you play that style of football for a prolonged period of time, it grinds you down in the end. You know, they're, they're known for the defence and stuff and, and fair play, but um, in the end, you will probably end up with a, a down year like this. Maybe not as bad as, as, as you think. But to be fair, you were saying this uh, at the back end of last season. I remember on our spreadsheets for talking about the podcast and I'm pretty sure I can remember one of it saying, Ricard Norling, is it time for him to move on? Is it just time for a change? So maybe it's sort of similar to the brand situation where it would have been more advantageous for the club had they just split perhaps at the back end of last season. I don't know, but he's gone now. I mean, you mentioned there statistically they're in, in, in had problems. Can you elaborate on that? 
Well, Air Carrier are a bit of a weird team because when, when for example, um, when they lost 4-1 to the North Shopping, I actually came out of that game thinking that I, I, I liked what I saw of AIK and I, res I quite respected what they were doing and I think sometimes you need, need patience. That, like you said, that I think that last season, although they did okay, that defensive kind of football had gone stale and I think it was there was a feeling this season that they need to, they need to regenerate. You know, this kind of stale football is not yeah. going to take them where they need to be. With your garden winning the title, they're big rivals. It was kind of like the time to, to really come back strong. I think COVID obviously hurt, hurt them because they couldn't really dip into the transfer market the way they would have wanted, I think. But sometimes you need that bravery to, to rebuild your squad and, and, and you've got to see it through. You know, don't bottle it when it doesn't go well. You know, t big teams in the past around Europe, they need, they, it doesn't, they don't come back straight away. You know, Jurgen Klopp, it took years for him to rebuild that Liverpool team um, and other, other clubs have rebuilt and it takes time. Um, you know, so, so that North Shopping game, I looked at it and I was like, although they got battered, there, there were things that I, I looked at in the game. I watched it really carefully and I was like, they're, they're trying something here, you know. They're fluid, they're tactically sort of trying things, but they're just really inexperienced. The defence is really poor. You know, they need a bit more experience in that defence. They need a bit more quality. Um, Teehee's good, but they need help in that defence because it, it's just not, the tactics weren't working. Now, Bartos Grizzle, like he's come in and said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with my tactics. I'm not telling you. <laughs> basically to the media um, he's a 41 year old coach who's you know fairly highly rated he used to be Norling's assistant um, but you know a couple of stats I mean they got ARK have actually had the highest possession in the league 57% ball possession so they have a lot of the ball but they don't do anything with it they've got the worst expected goals in the league lowest XG in the league that's relegation form below Ostersunds below Odebro and below Helsingborg Expected goals against as well. They're they're, they're they're struggling. You know they're one of the bottom five for expected goals against. So this is a team really that you look at it statistically. Remember when we talked about Ostersons last season? We, we called them out quite early on their XG. Um, if you look at the stats with their AIK, they're looking at relegation form really. If this continues, you can have all the ball you want. You can play all the nice sort of tactical game you want. You can you can you can be as free flowing as you like to be in the construction of your build up. But if the minute you give the ball away, it's in the other net, and if you've got the lowest expected goals, you can't, you can't finish. You're going to have problems, and so I think they're going to need to go into the market really to, to resolve this. I think there's too many holes in the team. Bartos Grizzly like, will probably try and change it from the point of view of, you know, tightening up the defence, maybe revert back to a, maybe four at the back system or something like that. Maybe just try and, and change that. Um, because they're going to have to tighten up and, and they're not scoring enough goals so whether they maybe loan a striker bring in a striker who knows but uh, yeah a very topsy-turvy team sort of not really going in any real clear direction at the moment they were relegated I think around 2007-ish um, off the top of my head uh, it was a shock relegation and they came pr uh, back up pretty quickly I think but um, Anyway, yeah, they, they need to score more goals, don't they? It's as simple as that. We've said that for perhaps the last two or three years anyway. Um, but big big changes needed at IEC, otherwise relegation could be very much on the cards there. Uh, worrying times for them. Um, let's just go back I mean, to... I, yeah, go on. I don't think they'll go down. Let me just be clear on that. I don't think they'll go down. But uh, statistically, they, they are looking like, you know, like yeah. they're in a bit of trouble. Um and you know the, the transfer window has been open since the end of July and you know Nabil Bahui come out and said this is the worst time I can remember since I've been at AIK you know the manager has come in now and there's a new game style and coach in place and he says that it's kind of um, it's a new basically a new a new era for the team and he says they're going to be hopefully back to a more normal game which is a bit of a you know read into that what you will what is normal but um, yeah there's just a kind of acknowledgement as I just said, um, that they, they, they're going to need to buy some players. I think mm. he, but who he's already said he wants some reinforcements. So when when players are saying that, you know that that's a worry. The sporting director uh, Henrik Urelis is going to be under a little bit of pressure. He's called he's called them out. But who he said that, you know that's his job. He needs to deal with it. Um, you know he's also mentioned that Henrik Oytum's in his last days and is playing maybe two matches. Sig Torsen's had COVID as well, so he's really not in the in the great form. Colbyn Sig Torsen, he's not been in great form, so they they definitely need attacking reinforcements and uh, yeah, a bit of pressure not just for the 
manager, but also for the the hierarchy in general. Yeah, as I say, worrying, worrying times for IE Core. Um, let's move move away from league matters uh, for a little bit. Uh, Malmo, obviously, in a great run in the Arsvenskan, but they did suffer a setback in the uh, Swedish Cup final. Uh, they lost to IFK Gothenburg. Uh, after extra time I do believe and uh, caught some of the goals for this game it looked like there was a crucial error uh, defensively that cost uh, Malmo in this one Jonathan how did you uh, rate the final was it dramatic it was dramatic but uh, you you can never you can never sell me a cup final with no fan it was quite sad I felt mm. um, I think I think Football has tried very hard to ignore the obvious, which is that there's nobody in the stadiums, and uh, I think you see it most obviously in cup finals. You know, it was really um, just felt. I saw Stephen Gerrard say that he didn't even enjoy his, <laughs> he didn't even enjoy the SPL opener against Aberdeen Rangers Aberdeen because he said that with no fans being there, he just didn't enjoy it, <laughs> which is quite, I think, an insight into his kind of style of play as well. He he loved it with, with the fans, didn't he? Um, I think this, the cup final was just a good game to be fair uh, both teams really gave it their all um, Malmo missed a massive chance to equalise in, in the last seconds of the game Toivonen uh, but yeah I, I was quite surprised that AF Core won the cup if I'm, if I'm honest but yeah their first uh, cup win since I think 2015 and fully deserved you know they needed a bit of relief um, you know Poy has barely been under quite a bit of pressure their financial situation is quite clear. We've talked about it in the past. You know, they've, they've had to sell quite a lot of players. They've brought a few in recently, but um, in terms of the cup, yeah, it was it wasn't really expected that they beat Malmo. But I think Malmo just took their eye off the ball, and, and uh, you know, that man Farnaru has also won it with Hacken. He was the the hero. Yeah, well, congratulations to them. I mean, you can't knock any any team that wins silver. And I know. The Swedish Cup is is highly sought after over there. It's treated pretty serious, isn't it? Um, going to Europe as well, and and just the sort of boost that a club like IFK need really, because it feels like they've been a little bit in the doldrums um, for a while. Um, I mean, fair play. I can't believe they they've managed to do that because Malmo are in such great form. Uh, what is it about Malmo uh, recently? They just don't seem to capitalise and, and, and win the silverware, do they? Um, you know, part of me wouldn't even be surprised if they somehow bottled, bottled the league from this point of view. Um, it's, a, it's a big shock result, isn't it? Everyone expected Malmo to win that one. Yeah, and the weird thing is they met a few days later and Malmo smashed them 2-0. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, it was kind of like, where, where were you in the cup final type thing? You know, they just dispatched them quite yeah. quite easily. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, having a tough season. And, and you know, I, I know I said that AIK could be in trouble in terms of relegation. I think EF Core will have a lot more worries on that front. Um, I think it's a massive window for them if they if they lose Alisson if they if they lose Alisson Yusuf and Kerry uh, as is rumoured they, their 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 squad is getting thinner and thinner haven't actually won since the second of July um, lost to Nordschipping lost to Jurgen drew with Helsingborg drew with Hammerby drew with Falkenberg drew with Beckelhaken lost three 0 to Malmo drew two all with Ostersunds but somehow they pulled out the cup win they've only won two games this season by the way um, so. And funnily enough, one of them was against AIK. So, uh, yeah, just a real sort of nice story for EF Core in the midst of a pretty drab um, couple of seasons for them, really. As Bargy is under pressure, there's no doubt about that. Fans are uh, sort of on his back. And I think one of the things which always worries you about managers is when other clubs' fans start to kind of pick up on it. And um, people are kind of starting to call out as buggy now because he's mm. he's been tagged as this sort of bright young coach, and I think people are now starting to maybe question that a little bit and say, well, what have you done? So I think it was really nice for him as well because he can hold that cup up and say, well, here I am. You know, this is what I've done. It's not the easiest of jobs. You know, given their club's situation, the, the financial problems. Um, now he's got them into Europe. He, he is a good coach. He's a you know he's a promising young coach. Um, Barnsley were looking at him at one point in the championship, so there's no doubt he's got pedigree. Uh, but just a nice little reward for him, given the, the critics that have had it, have been on his back the last few months. Yeah, well done to them. Fair play. And uh, IFK Gothenburg, Swedish Cup winners uh, this season. So uh, let's just go back to the Asvenskan. Let's have a look at the bottom of the league. And um, a couple of sides struggling there. Kalmar and Ostersunds, we're going to talk about them a little bit. Kalmar, rock bottom, just two wins all year. 
they've got problems, haven't they? Yeah, and I think they miss Niels Froling. We wrote, I wrote about him on the Scout blog. Check it out, our partners, Scout. Um, I wrote about him. He's an exciting sort of forward player. Uh, he, he's also eligible to play for America, as well as Sweden. So um, he's been out, and that's been a bad news for not only my fantasy team, but uh, for here, you know, Calmar in general, because, again, they're a bit of a strange team. They smashed Helsingborg 4-0. But really, since then, they just dipped and dipped and dipped. And... Um, I think we've got a quite a, a, a prominent Twitter fan um, who follows us, who's a Kalmar fan. And he seemed quite optimistic early in the season, but it really got pear-shaped quick for Kalmar. And I, I, I can't quite put my finger on well, I'm going to have to watch them a bit more closely because I haven't watched them in recent weeks, I'll be honest. Um, but yeah, haven't actually won since the 21st of June at, at Falkenberg 2-0. And, um, you know, they lost six in a row at one point. So, strange times there, really. I mean, it's, it's still very close down there at the bottom of the table, a number of teams in, in the mixer. I mean, uh, a lot of draws this season, it, it feels like, in the Osvenskan, Jonathan. Every, I'm just looking at the form table down there, it just feels like everyone's getting a draw at the moment. The Ostersunds have drawn their last five, at least the last five anyway. Helsingborg have drawn four of the last five. Not many wins down there, but a lot of uh, you know teams picking up a point apiece. And, uh, well, where do you see the relegation battle right now? I think Falkenberg are still favourites to go down. Uh, I'll be honest, I've watched them in a couple of games, and to be fair to them, they, you know, they. Also, Eklund, we had we had him on the podcast, and he is a manager that I do actually think is is decent. Um, I don't think he's a bad manager by any means, but I, I think they've got arguably the worst squad in the division fairly fairly comfortably. But they, they've picked up some results of late, and um, they've now climbed up to 13th. I still think it's going to be a, a slog for them. Uh, I expect them to sort of maybe drop down and be be sort of 14th, 15th, but. You know, a bit of an up, upward trajectory in recent weeks. Ossesons, I think you, you're you're looking at as now that Ian Birchall's left, I think they're gonna they're gonna have problems. Uh, they've dipped to 14th. You know, they've lost now as well. Jordan Atakadiri, who has been sold to Lommel in um, Belgium second division for about one million, one point two million euros, I believe. Uh, Lommel, by the way, who for those who don't know, are uh, part of the City Football Group, which is obviously owned by Manchester City. So you know, is that with a view to him maybe ending up in the Premier League? Maybe um, certainly, I don't like players going from Sweden to the Belgian second division. But um, there was always rumours Kadiri would leave quite quickly, and he was one of our ten, my ten to watch. And uh, I think I said on the show, watch him quickly because he won't be around for long. And lo and behold, he's, he's left. Um, a very good striker, and I think you know whether, we, whether he ends up in Man City, I don't know. But uh, certainly, a good a good player. He was their main man up front, and now without his goals, I think Ostersunds are going to be really struggling. So I think Falkenberg and Ostersunds now are, are probably the two that I would look at immediately and say could well go down. Um, Vibe boys have looked pretty good. Sirius are really doing well this season. We haven't talked much about them, but uh, fair play to Sirius. They've got some, you know, good players as well uh, and good management. So for me, Falkenberg, Ostersunds, mm. bottom two at this moment in time. Kalmar, Helsingborg, maybe they can recover. They've got. I think slightly better players, uh, certainly individual quality. You know, if if if, if Kalmar can get falling back, if they've got some other decent players in my opinion. Helsingborg, I don't see how they're down. I'm surprised that they're, they're doing so badly. Minus ten goal difference, the worst goal difference in the league. Scored ten, conceded twenty, which is which, which is awful. Um, I think they'll be down there. They've only won one game, but they they're going to need to get the balance right. But I think yeah, Falkenberg, Ostersunds, Helsingborg, um, and Kalmar. And then, like I said, EF Core and AIK need to be careful because they're hovering just above it. And I, I mm. don't think they can be too comfortable to say that they're, they're going to get out of it, especially with no fan. All right, just a couple of little housekeeping uh, things to tidy up on before we end the podcast. And a few listener questions uh, that we had tweeted in. Uh, we just talked about Sirius there. We had a tweet coming in from Dimitri Nechiporenko, who um, asks, uh, your thoughts about Adam Helborg from Sirius? Yes, yeah, Sirius are you know, a decent side. I uh, have to be honest, I haven't watched them a huge amount in recent weeks. But Helborg, he's okay. You know, he's a 22-year-old young player can play in the field. Um, statistically, he does quite well. You know, he, he, he keeps things ticking. You know, the accuracy of his passing is pretty good. 87% uh, pass accuracy. He's averaging this season about uh, 51 passes per game, 52 passes per game. So he's very involved in their, 
in their general sort of build up play. Uh, hasn't got any goals or assists or anything like that, but he's, uh, you know, doesn't get many shots on, but he, 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 he contributes to that build up play. Like I said, he, you know, averages about 4.26 interceptions per 90 minutes. So, you know, he, he, he sits in that midfield. Like I said, he keeps things ticking. Uh, and he's got a bit of potential. I haven't seen many rumours in terms of him, him leaving. But the one thing I would say about uh, Sirius is they, they have got they have got some quite good players. Yu Yu Sagita as well, uh, who's got a really journeyman career, but has um, come on quite strongly uh, and been really good. And, and a few others as well. Mohamed Saeed, he's having a bit of time in the spotlight. Um, he's been around the block for a while, but he's he's done quite well in this team. And I think like, their management in general has, has been very encouraging. I think I said it on the past show. I, I think their manager. Could attract bigger clubs if he continues at Henrik Miestrom. Uh, I think they're, they're outperforming any expectation of them, um, in my opinion. And they've got a few other players who've done quite well. Bjorn Strom uh, has weighed in with three goals. You know, the, their defensive setup is, is quite decent. Um, they've got another midfielder I like who's uh, called Nahom Girmai Netabai. You know, he's, he's a player I, I, I really quite like. Swedish, Swedish Ethiopian um, that they took from Varberg. You know, Stefano Vecchia, they, they got a decent squad, and yeah, Helborg is just sort of slotted into that and, and done okay. And one, one final question from uh, North Football um, asks Which Norwegian player has impressed you guys the most in the Alsvenskan so far this season? He suggests Ulverstad, Ritri, or Fear the Beard, hashtag, um, meaning Joe Inga Birgit, and I uh, think anyone who has. <laughs> Heard my thoughts about him historically. Uh, I've never been that impressed with Joe Ingeberget, but it seems like he's actually in some decent form for Malmo right now. Um, so fair play to him for that. But uh, is there, which Norwegian player in the Allsvenskan has impressed you the most, Jonathan? Uh, that's a good question, and yeah, at North Football uh, is uh, quite a good account to follow. In fact, so thanks, thanks for your question there. Um, I, I'm impressed with Sutherland. I have to be honest. I mean, mm. I know. It's maybe a bit of recency bias just with the, the Hacken game but uh, I, I like what he's brought to the team I think um, there's rumours uh, already Steve we talk about it every time now the transfer window's open there's already rumours of uh, Alexander Jeremy F calling back to Sweden he can link with uh, move back to Hacken or maybe uh, even EF Core their Doesn't rivals surprise me uh, he, didn't, he didn't last long in Germany at the moment if the rumours are to be true but um, I'm not sure he'd, I mean he'd probably get in the team he's a, a, a very good player at all spent kind of level but he's going to have some battle to keep Sutherland down because Sutherland is, um, you know, doing doing really well up front. Uh, and then the the obvious one is is um, Aslak von Wittry. You know, I think I think if I was saying who was the best player, you know, if you're looking at consistency over two seasons, Wittry definitely is the number one. And uh, we haven't talked about Eurogarden today. Maybe we'll cover them in the next episode because they're starting to recover. And I think you need to keep an eye on on Eurogarden. I don't think they're going away. So I think for Malmo and no shopping, you know, they're starting to chomp at their heels. And I think um, there's a story to be told there at some point. Um, but yeah, Wittry's a very good player. I think, I've said it before, he's like the Trent Alexander-Arnold of, of Sweden. Um, 24 years old, really solid right back. I think, I don't think he's, I'm not sure if he's been capped by Norway. I think he's only played for the under 21s. So that's quite interesting to me. I wonder if it's maybe just the visibility um, the fact that he's only played, you know, a smaller club. I think he played at Ranheim, so I think maybe maybe that's a factor him in him not being capped at a senior level. But you know, Norway might be looking at him because um, he's been a really really good signing for Jurgen. So I'd go Aslak. I'd, I'd go Aslak probably. All right. Well, I think that pretty much concludes this particular episode of the Nordic Football Podcast. As always, it's been a pleasure, Jonathan. Um, anything? Any final thoughts before we close things out? Um, not really to be honest I think uh, we did have a few other more questions Charlotte Patterson asked can Bode Glimp go all the way which I think you've answered uh, she also asked what do you think on the appointment of Bartos Greslak which I think we just covered there um, yeah in summary I think let's see how it goes he'll completely change probably their, their philosophy in my opinion I think they'll, they'll go to a more traditional style um, and then there was one more question from at football shorts uh, at footy shorts or who says who do you think is in the best position financially and organisationally? Steve, I'll throw this one at you 
to deal with what COVID may throw at the world. Is this an opportunity for someone? Um, I assume your answer is going to be Guru Glimp, but uh, number one, what do you think can Guru Glimp throw away? And number two, which team is best placed to uh, take advantage of you know, this COVID situation in, in, in Norway? Yeah, thanks for the question there, Charlotte. Um... Budiglim, I think they certainly can go all the way. Um, it's, it's, I still think Molder, uh, Molder themselves will not be going away. They'll, they'll give it a good shot. But Budiglim, uh, obviously winning that game was massive uh, in the head-to-head, -head. and then the Sanderfield result against Molder just gives Budiglim the edge at the minute. There's no reason why they can't go all the way. Certainly, if they keep most of their players. That second question for football short is a tough one because I think you really need to know. Is this about a question sort of worldwide or um, about the clubs in, in Scandinavia? To just be honest, in, just in, uh, in Norway, in terms of in know, Norway, on, yeah, that, it's that, the clubs that have got the biggest resources. Um, so you know, you're talking like Rosenborg, your Molders, size like that, I think. But and also like Buda Glimpse, the size that have got good youth academy players going through that way, um, and they've got big squads. Ultimately, I think the squad size is, is important. So, uh, yeah, it's a tricky tricky one to know without knowing the ins and outs of, of every side. But a uh, good question, really. I think he's right what he says. It's an opportunity for someone, whatever league in the world, um, to, to potentially upset the apple cart. But uh, you need to know, you know, good depth knowledge about certain clubs. Yeah, and thank you, Pretty Shorts, for that. Uh, my answer will be no shopping. I think... Um I think Bickle Hacken as well is one you can maybe look at, but I think because of the Gothi, the Gothia Cup and uh, the blow to their finances, they, they've got a really good academy, Bickle Hacken. Uh, so they're only seven points off the top of the table at this moment in time. And, and also traditionally, they've got a lower attendance. You know, their average attendance is nowhere close to sort of Malmo and North Shopping. Um, sorry, Malmo, you know, um, AIK, those kind of clubs, Hammerby. So I think Hacken can maybe bear that side of it and maybe... Um, try and get themselves into that Champions League maybe or, or, or you know certainly at least a European place um, and then of course you've got Elfsborg who are third in the table at this moment in time so can they take advantage of it always quite a, a, a big club but I think really North Shopping is the one I would, I would identify they're the ones who have spent big they're the ones who can take advantage of this lack of fans because of the fact that they don't have as big a stadium maybe as the others um, and also they've got quite a lot of money in coming in, in recent seasons Jordan Larson they sold for I think roughly four million euros to, to Russia so they've had that incoming and they've, they've spent it like I say on Valkyrie on Hellenius on um, other players that they've brought and they've got a quite experienced squad this is the time for them now really this is a season for them to try and win that league and I think what's going to be interesting in, in the second half of the season is can they hold their nerve and, and, and sort of see off the likes of uh, Malmo and, and also Eurogarden who I do think will come into the title race at some point So just before, just before we finish there was one other question from Robert Car Carwardine um, asking me can anything save Start and uh, Olesund and also any book recommendations on Scandinavian football I may have to get back to you about the book recommendation Robert but regarding Start <laughs> regarding Start and Olesund um, and to be honest, I, I think it's going to be a long season for them and they both may well go down. We'll, we'll probably talk about them uh, maybe in a future episode soon. Yeah, fair enough. That's um, Yeah, I mean, I, I would just... I'd read Zlatan's book to start with. I think that was, I, I really enjoyed that read. I'm a big Zlatan fan. Probably a bit, bit of a cliched answer, a bit of an easy one. But um, yeah, I think I, I enjoyed that book. He, he's got a lot of interesting insights into of his, his life and his background in Sweden um, before his career t kicked off so maybe that might be a good one to start with uh, but yeah if anyone has a book recommendation follow us on Twitter at Nordic Foot Pod and uh, tag us and we'll retweet it and, and, and throw it in the attention of Robert Kawadi maybe maybe one of us will have to write a book Steve you know, <laughs> maybe one day It'll maybe one day book. you never know so, uh, <laughs> get your memoirs going mate. Sure. So, uh, that's about it for this yeah. episode I think we've covered a lot of questions but uh if you've got any more, then show, throw them at Twitter and at Nordic Foot Pod. We are on Facebook, but it's kind of that page has been a bit slow of late. Um, but uh, we've got some plans coming up with this Patreon, you know, a few bonus episodes and a few other things we are thinking about to uh, bring you, continue to bring you the best content around Norwegian and Swedish football. So once again, appreciate your time. Uh, Steve, what have you got planned for the next few days? Playing cricket, watching Norwegian football. 
and uh, play a bit of golf as well. <laughs> it's gonna be a heat wave, so yeah. I'm gonna try some golf. I'm gonna. I'm planning some golf or something. Golf or foot really golf. golf. Foot golf or golf. No, normal golf. I'm normal like, golf. Oh really yeah, get your clubs out. Know. Get your clubs dusted off and get that out there on the golf course. It's probably the most safest sport to do in these COVID times. Yeah, I think at the moment social distancing. I think it's the one sport that you you know you can you can socially enjoy. So I might might dust off. Uh, well, I don't have any clubs, but I might might try and get involved. Well, good luck if you do. And uh, as always, it was a pleasure doing this podcast with you, Jonathan. And uh, until next time. Thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.